true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. Ten years ago, I sent an SMS to my brother saying, but I have an idea. The, the idea at the time was how could we fundamentally transform the way Zambia transacted. People used to send and receive money through buses, driving from town to town, or through their local post office. So how would we do this? We both had a passion for technology and entrepreneurship, and the, 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 the focus we would take was how do we build a set of financial products to bring to Zambia. It then became about the distribution. Our vision was, could we find 5,000 people under the age of 25 years old who had never run a business before, who had never had a formal job, and if we invested $3,000 in each of them, could we train them up to be entrepreneurs? We further knew that their social and family structures wouldn't be able to cover the costs while they set up that business, so if we covered all the overheads, including the wages, for six months, would we be able to set them up successfully? The vision was, could we create 5,000 community and village banks across Zambia? One year later, we'd built the products and we'd run out of money. We had no backers, no one would believe us, and we were, we were pretty much stumbling along, not sure what to do. So I thought I would share three key lessons that we've learned over the last 10 years. The first one is perseverance. Starting a business is an incredibly hard and difficult thing to do. You have to have a very thick skin. You have to learn to be told no hundreds and hundreds of times. It's quite interesting. I met a prominent uh, the soccer member of the community the other day, and he reminded me he used to work for a bank. Um, and when we pitched this idea to them, not only did they say no, but when we left the room, we were laughed at. And I think that is the life of an entrepreneur. One of my favorite quotes is those that are thought crazy, those that are thought crazy, those that dance are thought crazy by those that cannot hear the music. So the, the paradox between an entrepreneur is you have to be super confident on one side because you have to believe in something that no one else will, but you also have to be super humble and grounded and really live in your day to day. The other area where perseverance is just so important is cash flow. I often hear people trying to start a business talk to me about going, cash is difficult, I never, I never have enough money. The only thing I can say is 10 years later, we still have the same problem. So cash is king, you're always gonna be constrained by it, and it is a scarcity, unfortunately, in the markets we operate in. And that's why resilience is so, so important. The other thing about starting a business is once you start it, you then have to grow it. And growing a business is also incredibly difficult. When I started, I never thought so much of my time would be about managing, leading people. But I also probably totally underestimated that people are the very thing that will make a business successful or not successful. Within the space of three years, we grew from two people to 200 people operating in five different markets. The closest I could analogy I could find is imagine going from a, a family to a village, to a town, to a city in that short space of time. How you manage a city is not how you manage a village, and yet those were the things we, we had to work through. And that took a huge amount of effort and learning. One of my favorite cartoons is that there's a picture of someone riding a tiger, and a person watching the scene is sitting going, wow, look how brave that person on the tiger is. And the person on the tiger is going, how did I get on this tiger? And more importantly, how am I going to get off? <laughs> Whilst there is humor in that, three years ago, I was connected to a bunch of heart monitors in a hospital thinking I'd had a heart attack. But what it was, was an anxiety attack. The world had just started moving too fast for me. I was lying in that bed wondering, what am I doing? Why am I here? So I think the first thing I had to do is I had to look at my life. I had to stop burning the candle at both ends. I had to get some balance. I had to remember I was a, a husband and a, and a father. Um, I also had to retrain how I thought about management and leadership. I had to let go. Um, I had to hand over the reins to a bunch of other people. We'd grown big enough that it was no longer just about a few people. It was about a team. But most importantly, I had to reconnect to my why. I had to remember why I'd started the business. 
way back in the beginning, I remember sitting under a tree in Kateti talking to Edna, a rural cotton farmer, and she was spending 30% of her not substantial income on simple things like paying school fees, paying her suppliers, and receiving her payments. It made no sense. Equally, when I look at this picture, this is uh, somewhere in Malawi on, on Christmas Eve. Serving a purpose that is bigger than yourself and that matters and makes a difference was how I was able to reconnect back into the business. Again, when you start a business, you're often taking the road less traveled and you will hit potholes. There are bumps along the way and you need to be prepared for, for them. I thought I would share three of probably our biggest potholes as a business. The first one was a few years back. There was a currency crash, and overnight we lost 50% of our revenue. That was further complicated by our revenue was then in a soft currency, but our expenses and our borrowings were in a hard currency. So you're now between a rock and a hard place. The way we worked through that was just to go into a crisis management mode. Daily meetings, daily stand-ups, daily cash flow reconciliations, but what that did is between the traction we already had and the transparency we had with our shareholders, they were able to give us a bridge loan that supported the business until the three months we got back to where our numbers used to be. The second big pothole we hit was country expansion. We started in Zambia, we moved into Malawi, and that went pretty seamlessly. We built what we thought was a pretty impressive cookie cutter. But sometimes life has a way of humbling you. So uh, we had knowledge, but we forgot to learn. So we went into Mozambique and DRC trying to do the same thing, and it didn't work, and it cost us a whole bunch of lessons. The third big pothole we faced was understanding competition. When you're innovative and you're disruptive, you're inventing something new, you sometimes forget that once you build something, even if you're the first, it's actually pretty easy to copy it. The closest I could say to corporates, and this is about corporates that are good at what they do, they're like an elephant. They might be slow and silent to start, but when they decide to destroy the forest, they can. So if you are going to be an entrepreneur and you're trying to change the world, you need to decide, are you going to compete with corporates head on? Or are you going to run foster them and do things they're not going to do? Or perhaps do you decide to work with them and enable them? I think these are all important decisions to make. But the key lessons I'd like to share from those mistakes and challenges we had was, first and foremost, customer, inter customer inter intimacy matters. You have to know and understand your customers and always work to solve their problems. The other one is hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a plan. You have to not be that ostrich that puts his head in the sand. You have to be able to face the challenges front on and be very real about them. You also have to know and play to your strengths, and I think that's critically important. And finally, going back to that earlier point, cash is king in Africa. So always look after, look after your cash. The other thing about innovation and disruption and success and failure, it never goes in a straight line. Businesses that are successful do not go straight up, and businesses that fail do not go straight down. There's going to be peaks and troughs, and how you manage those are important. Zambia and some of the other markets we work in are often small and fragmented and face disruption. So you need to be able to learn to pivot. You need to be able to, be able to fundamentally change the way your business model works, your team structures work, and your business works. We've done quite a few pivots, so I'd just like to share some of the things we did to do it well. You need to be able to challenge your fundamental truths. As a business, we were used to growing at 10, 20% month on month. But when we stopped growing, we weren't always brave enough or smart enough to challenge that underlying assumption. So whatever your business underlying assumption is, you need to be brave enough to question it. You also need to be brave enough to build a fit-for-purpose vehicle which often means cutting costs. And cutting costs, unfortunately, often means people. And if you do have to cut people, the only advice I would give you is cut deep and do it once because it's an incredibly, incredibly painful process. The other thing you need to do is you really need to understand your value drivers 
and what you're good at. So that when you need to make changes, you know what to keep and you know what to let go of. The other one is often simple, communication. But it's often not done well. We have something called Frank Talk, which is after Frank Mutabela, where anyone in the business is able to ask us any questions they want, face to face or anonymously, so that they know the journey they're on and they understand why they're going. If people understand the why, the what is always so much simpler. And the final one is I think often as entrepreneurs, we try and keep everything inside. We, we, we think if we can't do it ourselves, it can't be done. But I would strongly encourage you to find mentors, to find people you can trust. A problem, a problem shared is a problem halved. So after 10 years, after that SMS, what have we done and what have we achieved? We have transacted over $2.8 billion on our platform. We've paid out over $280 million to young entrepreneurs. We've more than 3 million Zambians have used our products and services. We created over 4,500 jobs and raised more than $33 million of capital. But probably most important is we set out with the idea to fundamentally change the way Zambia transacts. And the Zambian payments ecosystem right now is one of the most competitive, innovative, disruptive in the sub-Saharan and potentially even the African region. Rates of financial inclusion are going up, and there's better and more products all the time. And that means the Zambian consumer has choice, and that means the Zambian consumer wins. So why does all this matter? Personally, it is critically important to me that we fundamentally change our perception of what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur should not be seen as second prize. It should not be seen as something you're doing until you get a proper job. Entrepreneurship should be seen as something that creates jobs. It creates employment, and it can create employment at an exponentially faster rate. And why is this important? 650 million youths under the age of 24 live in sub-Saharan Africa right now. 70% of those youths are either underemployed or vulnerably employed. By 2050, that number would have grown 51% to plus 900 million youths. There's a proverb that goes, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. We need to be very deliberate as stakeholders. What trees are we going to plant that our children and grandchildren can have gainful employment in the year 2050? I leave you with where we started. The true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. Thank you.